You have Patrick Fendaro, co-founder at Vetted Biz. Excited to have on Matt Holler, who's the CEO and president of the International Franchise Association. Matt, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, Patrick. It's great to be with you. How's it going today? Great. So I understand you've been with the International Franchise Association and people in the franchise world just call it simply the IFA. And you've been part of it for 10 years now, 10 plus years. Yeah, um, actually uh, 11 years. Uh, it's a long time to have a job in D.C. In the, in the same organization. It's a very transient town. But yeah, IFA uh, I've had a few different roles uh, at the organization. I uh, came in as a communications person and then became a, one of our lobbyists on the government relations team. And uh, last summer, I uh, was asked if I wanted to lead the organization. So yeah, I've been in this new, new seat for a little over a year now and uh, interesting times. And we'll talk about a lot of what's going on, um, not just in Washington, but inside the industry. So looking forward to it. And so what, what led you to stay in this, in this industry? Because I imagine there's all different types of opportunities in Washington, D.C. You grew up in, in Northern Virginia, like myself. There's a ton of opportunities for people to have relationships, know how to properly communicate, et cetera. What kept you to, to stay in, in the franchising space? Yeah, so this is my third trade association that I've worked at in D.C. I worked at the, at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which is sort of this big conglomeration of you represent basically free enterprise in, in every industry, right? And then I worked in the pharmaceutical industry um, in a very specific niche aspect, the, the pharmacy benefit managers um, for their trade association. And then uh, after that came to the IFA. Uh, and I think in my time here, I've just found, you know, people sort of tongue in cheek refer to the franchise family, but it's, it's, it's true. It's so communal. Um, there's such a culture of uh, being willing to share um, and to be able to, to be tasked with, you know, telling a story of an industry and, and protecting the industry, enhancing the industry, promoting the industry. That's our mission is protect, enhance, promote. You know, you'd be hard pressed to find an, an industry that is sort of easier in some ways to, you know, there's such great people and stories and things that you want to, you know, fight for um, and advocate for. Um, not that there isn't that in pharmaceuticals, uh, you know, you're saving people's lives with, you know, medicine and drugs and, and, and that kind of thing. But um, there's just a lot to work with that's really, you know, um, rewarding. And, uh, and I, I think also the people, right? It's just there's really great people in the IFA, in the broader franchising community. And, you know, we have a lot of assets that people that are doing, you know, this job at, in other trade associations, you know, are, are pretty envious of. There's definitely like a lot more information and people are very willing to share information, best practices where, yeah, compared to pharmaceutical, like you don't know what's going <laughs> on, <comfort>. IP protection, <laughs> yeah. where right. my conversations with franchisees, franchisors, they're usually pretty open with their struggles, their numbers, what they've learned recently. And they, it's kind of almost like a friendly competition, even with people like in the quick service restaurant space or in the hotel space where they're sharing best practices and knowledge so that everyone can, can go up. Yeah, absolutely. I think that we, we tell that to, to prospective members who come to us and say, tell me more about IFA. Like, what am I going to get out of it? Um, especially if they're an earlier stage, like franchise or concept. And we will say like, there are 11, 1200 brands who are in our organization and each of the individuals that are doing development or law or marketing, or, you know, the operations that you can, forge relationships with and will be willing to share, you know, how to be successful. And that's, that's pretty powerful as you know, one of the primary functions of a trade organization is, you know, you convene people through events and through, you know, other forums. And so I think we do a pretty good job of that. Um, and I think that's one of the great benefits of being involved in, in the IFA. And imagine if they were going to do it independent in IFA, like if they were going to like go through an expert network. I mean, yeah. these phone calls with like the president of a huge franchise group would be like a thousand, two thousand dollars plus an hour where someone that's an emerging franchisor and just getting their feet wet in the franchising space can like immediately tap into some pretty high up executives that have done it before with without paying like a crazy amount every time they're having a conversation. Yeah, exactly. So like we have a program called Friendship where we'll literally, you know, we'll, we'll assign you a mentor um, inside the IFA um, who's told us, hey, I'm, I have time to give back in mentorship um, and we'll you know, match people up based upon personalities and, 
you know, their specific areas of, you know, pain points and, and that type of thing. Uh, and look, there's, a, there's some really good, you know, we have 700 uh, supplier member companies at the IFA, and some of those are those sort of for-profit, you know, uh, mentorship or, you know, franchise consulting practices. And they're great members and believers and supporters of the organization too. Um, and some Goliaths, right? Do... Like I think Ecolab's yeah. a member, a few billion dollar plus companies. Oh yeah, Ecolab, Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, you know, those those giants. But, um, you know, we also have, you know, solo practitioners that are involved in, in the IFA and, you know, people that have run franchise companies and are now, you know, you know, maybe like in their waning years of uh, of work, but you know, people can't like can't quit franchising. I think in a lot of ways. Um, so we've got a lot of semi-retired people that are still have like tentacles in lots of uh, <laughs> different areas of the, of the of the industry, which is awesome. I mean, it's 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 a way for people to just continue to get back. But yeah, that's a lot of why it's it, it's it's rewarding to to be at an organization for you know going on you know over a decade. And how has franchising evolved over the last like eleven years? Yeah, um, that's a that's a great question. I, I would say the the thing I've seen the most is probably well, I guess two things. One, we continue to see just a proliferation of the types of businesses that are using the business model, um, you know, as a growth strategy, right? So um, over the last decade. And, and you guys see this in, in some of your work, just the sheer number of concepts that are, you know, have an FDD, you know, it just continues to, to explode. So you want to be in an industry that's a growth industry, right? Like franchising is clearly a growth industry. Um, I would say the other thing is, and, and this a little bit of a, of a less good thing, I think, is, you know, consolidation, right? We've seen more consolidation on, um, with brands underneath portfolio companies, there's a lot of benefits of that, of course, too. Um, but more so, where I'm thinking about it is uh, with franchisees, right? It's it's becoming harder and harder, uh, I think, to to scale and monetize, you know, as a single location owner, um, and that makes our job harder um, in an external facing way because, you know, we're we want to represent. And we do represent still, you know, mom and pop, you know, independently owned small businesses using a franchise model. But, you know, franchisees are getting bigger and there's a lot of reasons why, which we can get into if you want to get into it. But I think those are maybe the two biggest trends that that I've seen um, in my time. Uh, at the I think that's super interesting. I've never thought of it like that on the franchisee consolidation side. I guess it probably also divided by industries where you have like thousands of home care franchisees yeah. that are usually guys that own a hundred percent of the business operating one, two, three, four territories. Maybe they just invested 150 K to start the operations and they've grown the business to a million, 2 million, 3 million plus in revenue. But then you also have on the quick service space where probably there used to be, you know, operators that would run one restaurant, two, two restaurants, but now there's, been super a ton of consolidation where it's now operating 20 50 100 exactly. and it's a little harder to, to compete with, with those economies of scale exactly yeah and it's not to say that it's a bad thing that you know somebody can come in and you know quickly scale with a lot of capital um but it, it does um it, it has changed the industry um in in, in, in ways are there any efforts with the sba because i know a lot of franchisees are getting funding through 7a loans or even on the hospitality side in the 504. Um, what's your relationship with the SBA or are you advocating on behalf of, of making it easier, yeah. I guess, to get financing? Yeah, our SBA relationship is really good. Um, we've always, you know, as you as you allude to, we over index the amount of uh, franchise loan activity um, compared to the number of uh, uh, compared to non franchise businesses. So um, it's a good channel for us. We have we've had the administrator at IFA's uh, most recent um, DC conference um, to speak about kind of the work that we did together during the pandemic um, around ensuring that the PPP was tailored to you know the needs of the franchise community and specifically within hospitality. Um, and then similarly with with Idle um, and loan programs there. Um, moving forward. Um, there's actually a really important rulemaking going on right now um, at the SBA that they announced a couple of weeks ago, which you know would totally transform the way 
that the franchise um, community and the, the SBA's franchise directory uh, is uh, is utilized by lenders to determine eligibility for SBA 7A um, lending and uh, SBA Express loans. So you know that's uh, that's that's on that's a proposal right now. We've actually been talking to SBA uh, staff even this week about you know some concerns we have, but also um, some of the opportunities that um, this might um, create for it to be easier for franchise brands to and their franchisees ultimately to. To have fewer hurdles to get, um, you know, their franchises funded through SBA programs. So a little bit of maybe of shifting of the burden towards the lending community, um, whereas today it's incumbent upon um, directly on the brand to get listed on the directory, um, which can, in some cases, particularly for smaller concepts, be more challenging when you have less um, less of a proven track record and things like that. Yeah, it makes it makes sense. I know the SBA is pretty transparent with the data they release with the regular FOIA request, and we've dug dig through. But like, if I was a franchisee, I would and say that the franchise brand was already pre approved. You can get the data on who lent to your current franchisees, and then you hit up those banks because it's much easier doing business with someone that's already very familiar with with the brand right. than going with maybe your current commercial lender, but having to explain, you know, this is a great yeah, business concept. A, and yeah, yeah, you've got to take in a whole business plan and, you know, educate them on the concept. Whereas, you know, if you're going to ABC Bank, that's done 50 loans already for that, you know, 50 other exact businesses in other areas of the country, you know, you could you should be able to kind of get right in that pipeline and move, and move through. So yeah, it's uh, it, SBA is a great partner. Um, a lot of great SBA 7A and express lenders that are that are out there. And I think it, we'll see probably a spike in SBA lending as we head into this recessionary or we're in this recessionary period, you know, where, where commercial credit tends to dry up a little bit more um, and it gets more expensive too. And the rates, what I've seen from the non-SBA side are still pretty reasonable for someone that wants to get going with a franchise or maybe acquire an existing location or five um, franchises that are already up and operating the the loan rates aren't that crazy yeah I mean, especially with what's happening with interest rates now on the on the commercial side so i totally agree i mean in fact in it was early on in my ifa tenure but i recall that coming out of the great recession um the issue was you know commercial credit totally dried up sba credit was still um you know relatively available the issue became the overall amounts of the, the funds available for their subsidy um, was the issue because there was it was really the lender of only resort um, for a good chunk of time there. So we were actually lobbying um, and ultimately were successful in getting Congress to increase um, the overall volume of funds available in the 7A program to ensure that uh, you know small business startups didn't totally fall off a cliff um, in kind of the coming out of that that 2008 uh, time period. And Matt, beyond the SBA initiative that, that we just talked about, what other yeah. initiatives are you excited about for 2023 that you're spearheading your colleagues at the IFA? Yeah, well, I'll cover maybe on the government relations side first, um, some of the things that I don't know if I'm excited about them, but because uh, a lot of times they're, they're not good things sure. that are proposed by government that we are, you know, hoping don't come to focused fruition. Focused on. Uh, yeah, focused on is probably the better way to, to put it. So the we've had this fight over uh, joint employer status for you know since 2014 or so, and it's kind of seesawed back and forth depending on who's in control of the of the federal government. And you know, right now um, the National Labor Relations Board has proposed uh, to expand the joint employer status um, to a much broader test than it has been over the last uh, six years. Uh, and it would potentially make every franchise or brand liable for the labor and workplace conditions at their franchisee locations. Of course, that would be you know, hugely significant cost to franchisors, um, hugely disruptive to the obligations uh, of their franchisees, who, of course, are the ones directly in control of you know, the labor and workplace conditions at the restaurants or hotels or retail locations or whatever it may be that they operate. So we are uh, actively involved in a similar comment um, process to that agency. Uh, we've been encouraging a lot of our members to get involved directly um, in offering comments either through the IFA or on their own um, through a program that we have called the Franchise Action Network that allows people to send letters either to agencies or to 
uh, their congressional or state elected offices. So um, that's a big deal for um, for the IFA right now. Um, it will be for the next couple months. Um, On that point, like, yeah, thinking about all the tech workers, like Uber drivers, like I know they've gone after like making Uber dri- that Uber drivers should be employees, and like that relationship is like for me much clearer. You have the drivers, you have the the company that is driving that direct economic benefit from those drivers. But at the end of the day, they, they're not considered joint. Em, they're not considered employees, right, of, of these big tech companies like Uber. Yeah, I mean, that issue is, is more on the independent contractor um, versus jo- like so. So that issue, um, there's been a push to make all independent contractors, whether they're delivery drivers or Uber drivers, employees of the platforms with which um, they um, may operate on. Um, So that's really creating employee status. What we're focused on with this rule at the NLRB is joint employer status. So um, having two direct employers um, of employees workplace. So, you know, you can imagine the confusion that would um, ensue if they're, you know, (laughs) let's say the the franchisee is already being squeezed and nobody's in charge. The franchisee is already being squeezed with like raising employment costs and all these other food costs or whatever it's in the front in the if it's if they're in operating in the food industry. I mean, like, I guess at the end of the day, like probably the, the public perception of Californians might be that these franchisees are all mega millionaires where in reality, right. some of them might be making 50K a year, 100K a year, and they're they're working really hard for that. Yeah, exactly. And and so you know, at the end of the day, in a franchise system, like just they need to know, brands need to know where their obligations are and franchise owners need to know what their obligations are. And it's all governed by the contracts. And, you know, now here we have government that's kind of moving a goalpost in the middle of that contractual relationship and it creates ambiguity and uncertainty, and it creates a you know really open door to litigation, which is what we saw the last time. Um, you had a lot of plaintiffs' attorneys suing franchisors and franchisees claiming joint employer status. Um, that creates a lot of cost, and then that of course means that franchise brands are less inclined to offer some of those services that benefit the brand, but that might create ambiguity around labor or employment responsibilities. So, I mean, that seems that's... like a big reason. I mean, whether it's for capital or the franchise or not wanting to hire, train, fire employees, that, that's a big reason they don't just open corporate locations. So correct. if, if you take that away, it's like, well, it, is the franchise model even going to work in California? That That's yeah, the whole I mean, purpose. I mean, Right. When we say that this is a direct attack on the franchise made way of doing business, I mean, what you just said is exactly why. Um, it's not just a, you know, a, a throwaway sort of statement. Like it, it truly is, it cuts right at the heart of why a biz, a brand franchises and why a franchisee, you know, pays a royalty and pays a franchise fee. I'm going to get some stuff from you um, in exchange for money. You're going to give me these things that you're obligated to give me, which help me and help grow the brand. Like, and joint employment, you know, makes both of those obligations um, harder, if not impossible. Yeah, it's scary because, I mean, California is the most populated state and there's a lot of franchisees that are doing very well there, franchise brands that have been created in California. But, you know, 95 percent plus of franchises, it seems like the distinction with the franchisees hiring, training, firing at times and then taking care of the customer. And if you take that away, yeah, it's it's going to I can only imagine what's going to happen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you mentioned California. Um, this this labor work proposal would apply, you know, to the you know every franchise in, in the country, really every business uh, in the country if it if it goes through. So sorry, California this is at the for, federal level. This is at the federal level. Oh, yeah, wow. we we were fighting joint employer in the state level in California. We're actually successful in getting uh, joint employer provision removed from this this legislation nice. called the FAST Act, um, but the bill ultimately became law without the joint employer provision. But it did create a, a, a new wage and workplace council um, that would set um, wages and workplace conditions for specifically the fast food um, and fast casual um, restaurant industry. Uh, so for any, uh, any franchise brand um, operating in that sector with 100 or more locations nationwide, um, but even if you have one location of a you know, McDonald's or you know, other type of service restaurant, 
in California, you're subject to the the rules that would be created by this 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 new branch of government, basically to regulate that um, that industry. Um, it's it absolutely groundbreaking in terms of this this policy. <laughs> um, and of course, you're you're not subject to the the council if you're if you enter into a collective bargaining agreement because people often always ask me like why is this stuff happening like why are these crazy proposals you know being adopted or yeah. you know, pursued at the federal level the state level the local level and my answer is always you know organized labor and you know organized labor specifically the service employees international union like they have a stated objective and have for, since 2012 to increase market share, right? Just like, you know, you may have a board of directors that's saying, you know, we're gonna grow and scale. They have a board that said, what other sectors of the economy can we grow and scale in? And they've identified the restaurant industry and specifically the franchise sector as areas where they can increase labor union market share. And the way that they feel like they can do that most successfully is not by unionizing under the existing rules, going to Patrick's location and Matt's location and, you know, offering a value proposition of, you know, if you join a, a union, you're going to have higher wages and better benefits. They said, no, we want a national organizing strategy and we want to negotiate with the brands, not with the franchisees. But to negotiate with the brands, they need them to be jointly employed with the franchisees employers. So they need to change the rules, move the goalpost. Or this California model is they want a sector wide union. So it's not, it wouldn't even be directly with the brands. It's they've gone and told the California legislature, create a new branch of government that will set <laughs> workplace and wage conditions in this one industry, but they will be exempt from the council if they are part of a collective bargaining agreement. I love that you provided the context because I didn't know like kind of the what the forces were at play, but I mean, unemployment's so low right now. Like and where I live, it's 3.5%. Yeah. McDonald's workers, they're being offered way above minimum wage with bonuses if you stay on like a week or two. So it's like, exactly. there's a ton of job opportunities. And if you don't like your job, you can find another job if you're willing to put in the time. So Right. I mean, workers have never had more power than they have today. Exactly. And that's a great thing. But like the notion that they need to give away you know, some portion of their paycheck to a union to get their wages up or improve workplace conditions, it's just not realistic or necessary because employers have to provide, you know, safe working conditions and follow laws and provide competitive wages or they're going to be out of business. Like it's just, there's not, there's not any need for this other than creating increasing political union market share, you know, for, you know, these organizations that, you know, love to control and have power. And, and they have a lot of money. So it and sounds so like, is, yeah, I mean, very few people will benefit while like tons of people can lose a ton of, ton of money. And I can't right. imagine just all those franchisees, like maybe you invested in a brand that has 200 units, just happens to have 200 units. And now you're part of this and it's like, you already invested 700 K, you know, you thought it would take four years to get your money back five years. But now if wages are going up and food costs are going up, it's like, shoot, this is going to take like 10 years and I'm not going to open exactly. up more locations and employ more people. Yeah. I mean, I've talked to countless people in franchising who have said, you know, I will not go to California because of what the legislature has done, even if I'm not in the restaurant industry. Like the, it's just this, because there will be a trickle down effect, right? Like labor market inflation will be real if this comes to fruition. I do want to make sure I share that the good news is we have launched a campaign to make sure this law, this new council in California never actually goes into effect. So one good piece of news about California is they have a referendum um, right. option where if you collect uh, enough signatures, you can overrule uh, any law created by the legislature and then put the question to the voters to either affirm or uh, deny uh, this law. So this is what the gig economy did in 2019 uh, with Proposition 22 after the legislature passed a law that would have made all the Uber and Lyft drivers, employees of these platforms against the will of the drivers themselves. And then ultimately against the will of the voters who said 60 plus percent of them in the election in 2020, that no, we don't want this law. And it was ultimately, so that question will go to the voters in 2024. Nice. Yeah. It's, 
it's sad that it has to get to that level, but at least there's that right. mechanism that people can really understand clearer and, and IFA and other institutions can av- can basically educate the, the California. Exactly. What, so it's what a long game and, you know, investing in the long game is, you know, sometimes uh, not, not just expensive, but time consuming, but it will ultimately be worth it um, when we're successful. Any other initiatives you, you, that you think might be worthwhile? We have a lot of prospective franchisees that list yeah. in existing franchisees, franchisors, vendors. Yeah, so I, I wanna make sure I mention some of the work that we're doing in education. Um, so beyond, so when I mentioned our mission statement, it's protect direct franchising, enhance franchising. You know, our role in that is both through kind of informal education, you know, coming to our events and, you know, meeting people and franchising, um, learning about, you know, how to do, you know, how to become a, a franchise owner. But we also have a, a certification program called the, the CFE program. Uh, and we've recently launched a, a partnership with the University of Louisville, where they uh, will now operate um, five uh, fundamentals of franchising. So people that are, you know, just starting out in franchising or people who are interested in becoming franchisees or, you know, industry suppliers, you know, should look at that program as a way to kind of brandish um, their skills. Um, And also, of course, these are great networking opportunities with your peers um, across the industry. So really very excited about um, the investment that the IFA is making uh, in, in education. And then we're also seeing this um, at other colleges and universities. I mean, nobody really goes to college to become a franchisee or you know become a you know executive in a in a franchise organization. Like it's not really a uh, you know a hundred level, two hundred or three hundred level course in a in a business school. But well, it's like my brother's. Seeing... He gra- graduated. My brother and business partner Jack. He graduated from Georgetown, and a lot of people were confused if he was going to work in a Burger King. Like right. half the people thought he was going to actually just work at a Burger King. Then other people understood it was like, no, he's going to go to the corporate office in Miami and they also have some other franchise brands. Yeah, I mean, they're, but being more intentional about um, this is a huge industry. It's three and a half you know, percent of private sector GDP. There's 800,000 businesses just in the U.S., not to mention you know, what's happening globally with, uh, with franchising. Um, I mean, there's just a huge amount of opportunity um, so investing in those relationships and, you know, a lot of our members have started to see with, with what's going on, you know, with labor shortages and, the, you know, competing for employees, not just frontline employees, but, you know, seasoned executives. Um, so IFA, you know, there's now over 4,000 people that are, um, CFEs, um, inside the franchise space. A lot of our members will look specifically for people that have that experience. Um, as a franchise executive, um, when they're filling, you know, head of development or head of marketing. Um, so that's something that we're excited about. We're going to see a lot more, um, uh, educational investment from the IFA, uh, moving forward. And I think also the, the, the indirect benefit is that it helps improve the quality of the channel of commerce that we're, that we're in. Right. Well, also um, the brand, the better... I mean, you have some great brands that there was a founder that was a industry expert. So whether it's a gym concept, maybe it's a restaurant, they're really good at that. But if there can be talent to surround them that has a certain educational background or work background, more corporate executive type, then it can really solidify a lot of the systems and basically essentially professionalize it. Where going back years, there were a lot of great founders that had a great concept. They had, you know, the right the right um ambition they had the right ambitions and objectives but they didn't have that network of people that can really elevate the brand and and take it the next level and make sure franchisees made money and that everyone was rising up together exactly yeah i mean bringing in franchising expertise to pair with a founder is you know in that in that journey is is critical so you know we have a i think a role to play um in that. And that can ultimately lead to better outcomes for franchisees and, you know, better system performance and better overall health of uh, the franchising sector. So besides the educational components with University of Louisville and the other universities that are starting to offer some sort of like franchise component to their to their uh, university, what are some ways that prospective franchisees can navigate, you know, the thousands of opportunities that are available in, in franchising? 
Yeah, so I, there's a lot of great information on a lot of websites out there. Um, so as you're sort of beginning that franchising journey, um, you know, franchise.org, you know, is a great place to go. You know, that's our website, you know, in terms of reading about, you know, what is a franchise disclosure document? Like, what are the basic things that I should be asking? Um, you know, you can fill out leads um, and forms and, you know, get in touch with brands directly. But just kind of the basic level perusing of franchise investment information, um, you know, what are the franchise fees? What's the total investment required? Um, that type of information is available. I think, you know, going to expos, you know, it's still, you know, for some people, a good way to kind of begin a, a franchise journey and kind of see and meet, you know, yeah. individuals that work inside a brand that you might be interested in, or, you know, if you're really just in that like tire kicker stage, as we call them, you know, to get a, get a sense. So we put on a few expos uh, around the country uh, here in the U S and also partner uh, globally with a, with, on a, on a few uh, franchise expos. The thing I always tell people though, is talk to other franchisees in that system or just franchisees in general. Like what is it like being a franchisee? I mean, the, the information is there um, to be able and to, they're get, open. Um, and they're open they, and, and they will, they want to share it. Right. Uh, and, and if they don't want to share it, like that's probably telling you something, you know, maybe about that system that could be a red flag. So by contacting, you know, current and former franchisees, I think is, is critical um, as, as well. Yeah. I like the expo. Cause you can essentially speed date with like 20 to right. 30 brands. And then if you, if one of them picks your interest, then you can further evaluate it, have a call with their fr head of franchise development or someone from their staff, and then start talking to some existing franchisees and former franchisees. Yeah. And a lot of our members have, you know, if you go to, you know, their website, right. Or you can get to it from our website or other kind of portals, as we call them out there, like they'll have artificial intelligence that will like, you know, allow, you know, just like you, you have a problem with your phone bill, right? Like you can chat with Verizon, you know, through their website, like you can, you can, it's, you can start a conversation with an individual, um, you know, on a website and the really good franchisors are, you know, within an hour, you know, somebody is, you know, scheduling a call to, to you because they, they want to ferret out, you know, how serious you are as well um, at that early stage of that um, sort of franchise um, recruitment and development process. So I, I wouldn't be shy about it. Um, if you're truly interested, um, there's a, there's a ton of information out there and, and, you know, there's a lot of great people that want to, want to share it with, with you. So, what, what do you think about working at a franchise before pursuing ownership? Like you have some amazing brands out there like Domino's, Chick-fil-A that really advocate like hi hiring from within and like giving the financing yeah. mechanism for someone to open up their own franchise. And with Domino's, they, I don't know how many millionaires they've printed. That's like 90% of Domino's franchisees worked as crew. Exactly. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think, look, if you're a teenager and are starting... <laughs> you're watching this it depends like, when you're where you are in your yeah, career. Yeah. Yeah, totally. But I, I look, I think, you know, all of our members are in you know, huge demand of frontline staff. Like if I were thinking of becoming a franchisee and kind of had zeroed in on, you know, two or three systems, you know, I might go talk to crew and, you know, ask what it's like to work there um, or go, you know, work in that restaurant um, to, to just truly, you know, learn the business um, inside out. But yeah, there's some amazing brands that have really invested in, you know, employee to owner um, type of programs. Domino's and, and Chick-fil-A are, are two of them. Um, but we see it across the... Even some smaller concepts. Like I interviewed the founder of yeah. Frenchies Nail Salon that spoke highly of the IFA, Caring, Senior Care, one of their franchisees. Like yeah. they started like in their late teens and now they're, they're franchisees. Yeah, it's really... I mean, they want to find people that are passionate about the business and be, are going to become brand ambassadors. And yeah, it's a really powerful uh, growth strategy. So yeah, if you're, if you're under 25, uh, this, <laughs> this definitely can be a great mechanism and even above depending where you are in your career, what type yeah. of businesses should and should not consider franchising? So I think a business that shouldn't consider franchising is a business that's not yet profitable. Right. Um, you should not Sounds be basic. taking it. I mean, it's incredibly basic, but <laughs> you know, you'd be surprised how many times it happens, unfortunately, where somebody's literally franchising and taking money from other people 
just to make themselves as a franchisor become profitable. So, you know, that is not the right, that may be a franchisable business at some point, but it is not a franchisable business in our view uh, today. Um, a business that should be franchised is, you know, a business where, you know, you've demonstrated, you know, I would we say unit level economics, right? If you, if one box is making money and then the next box is making money or territory is making money um, and you're operating them yourselves, you know, you're, you know, you've, you've checked the box to be able to move to the, okay, let's, let's determine the business plan for the franchising aspect of, of this business. What do you think it's a good like unit count, like three, three locations, five that have positive cash flow? I think it depends on, you know, is it a retail facing business? Is it a, you know, more of a territory kind of home based sure. business? I, I think, you know, three is probably the, the minimum yeah. um, that that I think is 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 reasonable to say, you know, we've shown this in multiple markets or multiple, you know, areas of, you know, one re one market or, or region because that's, you know, that's what you're going to have to do. That's what your franchisees are going to have to do and you're going to be you're going to need to create a system and a team that's going to support those other locations um, with, you know, five to ten percent of uh, of that franchisee's revenue. And so, what's what's the model that's going to be able to make you continue to be profitable, support the growth of the brand as you you know begin to go on that that franchising journey? So, I think that is the type of business that um, that is franchisable is once you have demonstrated that, um, you know, in a, in a small unit count. I probably get asked weekly for people that want to start selling franchises. And I, that's what I say, like they have one concept or they're not even operating in the United States and they have a yeah. great concept that works in Europe or Brazil, et cetera. And I'm like, go to your friends and family and people already in your network and, and open up some more locations and then and then make sure it works. And then you can recruit people you don't, don't know because people you don't know if there's some downturns, they're not going to be as forgiving as if it were uh, a customer of your existing business, a family member, a friend. Yeah, I mean, it's it is it is a marriage, right? Like you are in a marriage for in in most cases, you know, ten years. That's you know, sort of the the average franchise agreement, and your interests need to be inherently linked, right? Um, so I think another you know flaw in you know people that franchise that probably shouldn't be are those that, you know, want to maintain all of that control, you know, or don't want to give up, um, you know, elements of control, like, you know, franchising may not be right for you. Um, and similarly on the franchisee side, right? Um, like if you're the type of person that thinks every idea is, you know, your idea is, is the right idea, like you're probably not the right profile of, you know, a franchisee in most, in most cases, right? It's somebody that, you know, understands their own limitations and is willing to kind of work within the confines of, of an agreement. Uh, it's not to say that some of the most incredible ideas had to come from franchisees. Um, but there's but, a process you know, for the certain, franchise or filters, yeah. filters that up, maybe tests it out Correct. on a corporate location, then rolls it exactly. out to everyone. Exactly. I've seen, I've seen veterans be super successful in franchising. Yeah, I mean, we have a program for 31 years now called VetFran. Um, it's part of our IFA foundation. And what VetFran does, um, there are 600 or so brands that offer discounts off initial franchise nice. fees to vets. Um, a lot of times they're struggling with, um, you know, access to capital. So making that initial investment a little bit more uh, more easier. There's, you know, special financing programs, including through the SBA um, for, for veterans. But, you know, from a from a style, you know, and how veterans operate in in the military, there's a lot of similarities yeah. in terms of, you know, being part of the team, following a very systematized approach that translates really, um, really neatly to the to the franchise model. So um, over 14% uh, of franchises are owned by veterans, um, which is a really great um, story. So and you, you know, if you're vets watching this, you know, check out vetfran.com. Um, which is our website. You can see all the brands that are um, involved in that program, the discounts they offer. There's some great stories. Um, and actually, there's a specific mentorship program that we have for vets that are beginning their franchise journey. There's a guy that works for me called Eric, his name's Eric Johnson. He's a Marine. 
you know, he'd be happy to get on the phone with you and talk about, um, you know, veteran franchising journeys um, and plug you with some brands. Very cool. Yeah, I, I imagine this, like you said, 14%. I, I can only imagine small business owners, like non-franchise must be a fraction of that. I think it's 7% of all small businesses are in that. Okay. So, yeah. So that's a big, big, big difference. Um, what are the requirements for becoming as well as maintaining IFA membership and focusing on the franchise or the franchise brands? Yeah. So franchise orders, we have about 1200 brands that are members of the IFA. Um, the fee schedule, um, ranges depending on us, uh, gross system wide franchisee, um, sales. And so, you know, the requirements are. Um, you have to be in business, uh, you know, for you know, a certain period of time. Um, you have to have a franchise disclosure document and actively be operating franchise locations uh, in order to be a, a member of the IFA. And then, you know, it's, it's a membership based model. So it's a one year membership um, based upon that um, system wide size. You know, that is an organizational wide membership. So, you know, anybody that works for that company. Um, can be involved in the IFA, receive our communications materials, attend our conferences at uh, our membership rates, uh, leverage you know, the things that we offer in terms of our website listings, um, where we have you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of um, unique visitors coming and looking at franchise opportunities and looking at uh, member brands. You know, a lot of our members will use you know, IFA as kind of a on their own franchise development sites to show that um, you know, they're part of this, uh, organization that is, you know, dedicated to protecting, enhancing, promoting franchising, um, in terms of maintaining the, the membership, you know, it's, it's really about, I mean, it is about, you know, continuing to, um, you know, resource us through the, the membership fee, but I always just tell people, you know, there, there's no doubt in my mind that you'll get out of IFA more than what you, what you put into it. Right. Um, it, it's like, it's like any organization that you involve yourself with. Like you want to set aside the time to make yourself available, to take advantage of, you know, thought leadership opportunities, you know, our advocacy work, the promotion of your brand through our channels, um, the networking that comes through IFA events and increasingly through kind of virtual experiences. Um, and so, you know, that's, those are some of the things that go into, you know, becoming an IFA member and then ultimately maintaining um, IFA membership on the, on the franchise. What about website. like the franchises where maybe they've had sustained success in the past, but now there's a new owner and they're just closing a lot of locations. Cause I've seen a couple of brands that they're probably not even members of IFA anymore, but they have that badge. They also have the badge of the franchise 500 list. Is there a way to like boot them out or to not allow them to use that kind of IFA seal? How, how do you go about that with some of those brands that aren't performing as well? Yeah. So if you're you know, not an active IFA member or, you know, there's been some sort of, you know, litigation or um, state action, you know, maybe against a concept, like we will, you know, do what we can to, you know, try to police the use of our marks. Yeah. Um, so, you know, sending, you know, cease and desist letters or, you know, other things like that. Um, but there's, you know, I, I would say that a company that's hell bent on like misleading, um, in an intentional way, like the public, um, you know, in a lot of ways, what are, you know, we're not the franchise police, sure. like at the exactly. end of the day, like it's the job of the regulators, um, to, you know, ensure if somebody's violating the law, um, and misusing marks or misleading a prospective franchisee, then that's their job. Like our job is to improve the quality of franchising within the channel of commerce that, that we have control. We do that through education. We do that through our advocacy. And, you know, ultimately, um, you know, we do it through trying to be, you know, better educate franchise customers, right? Prospective franchisees through, you know, having a conversation like this that, you know, you and I will make attempts to get as many eyeballs on as possible. Definitely. And my hope and your hope is that, you know, that individual that's going to listen to this is going to say, oh, I learned something and I'm going to apply it to my franchise investment decision. And, you know, at the end of the day, that's that's what we, you know, that's what we hope for. Um, so the, the industry is not perfect. Not all franchisors or franchises are created equal. Um, and, you know, our job is to use the free market system that we, we operate in to help people make the best informed uh, decision that they can make. Yeah, I love it. Cause if the prospective franchisee, whether they're a vet through your, 
through your educational component for veterans or, you know, they're tired of their job and they're looking to quit to the extent that they can get more information and be an educated buyer. It's better for everyone. The, the franchise brand wants someone to be, you know, for the long term, as educated about what right. they're getting into as possible because it is it is like a marriage. Yeah. And like like I said, not all brands are created equal and not every franchisor is as forthcoming with information. And, you know, the more we can educate franchisees and prospective franchisees about the questions they should be asking about how a franchisor is performing, you know, things like item 19 data, um, which is the financial performance representation that's not required, but if it's not there, that may be- It's become you know, a lot more common. You. I think it's like 58, it's 59% I mean, we, of brands. Yeah, I mean, we saw a dip during COVID and there's, you know, myriad reasons why brands sort of pull back providing FDDs, uh, FPR, excuse me, during uh, during COVID because it might be actually misleading in terms of, you know, how they would perform in a normal uh, year. But yeah, more than 50% of brands are, are providing FPRs. Not all franchise performance representations are even created equal. Um, you know, so that those are those are really serious questions. It's on the buyers. You get... you, I guess the buyer has to own the process. It's, it's on them to vet the information they receive with existing franchisees, and you mentioned even former franchisees. And yeah, exactly. Have and that, that contact information. Yeah, and and the Federal Trade Commission, which you know has looked at you know FPRs, has has you know each time they've looked at you know should we require more information to be mandated to disclose has has ultimately decided. Um, you know, mandating is going to potentially lead to, you know, more um, misinformation than than the current regime. And, you know, the onus is on the franchisee to do their own due diligence um, and on the franchisor to, you know, disclose information that helps provide that. And I think it's up to us, you know, in the private sector, you know, information providers, whether it's, you know, organizations like IFA or yours, Patrick, um, you know, to to raise the bar in terms of ease of access of that information and distilling it into ways that, you know, people are consuming information today versus, you know, reading a thousand page franchise disclosure document, um, you know, making that simpler for people to consume through, you know, video and conversation and, you know, other forms of digestible content is, is really important. And, you know, another thing that, you know, we are spending more time on at the IFA today than uh, ever before. I think with with a more educated prospective franchisee and even franchisors, like the free market will show which which opportunities are the best and which ones to avoid. And if you're one of the ones to avoid, then maybe you shouldn't be franchising or maybe you yeah. need to be changing something with your business model and consumers more and more are able to get that information easier. Yeah, I mean, data and information sort of uh, can can shake out a lot of, um, you know, PR spin exactly. that uh, people <laughs> and friends attempt to put on uh, a certain uh, a certain opportunity. Well, Matt, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I've learned a ton about IFA, your initiatives, what you're focused on, maybe not excited about, but what you're focused on in terms <laughs> of uh, some of the policies. But someone's got to do it. These aren't the most fun things. And Someone's got to work. Yeah, through. and I would say, thanks, Patrick. I mean, don't don't be scared about coming into franchising. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't want to scare anybody away. Like, there are real issues, but there's you know a real legitimate, well resourced organization that you know has the back of everybody in franchising. And you know, candidly, whether you're a member or not, you're going to get the benefit of what we're doing to protect and answer from a franchising. Well, Matt, I really appreciate having you on. We'll include links to the IFA, um, the, the veteran. Vetfran. Vetfran. Vetfran.com. We'll also yeah. include a link to that. Um, and yeah, really appreciate having you on. All right, Patrick. Thanks. Good to be with you. Thanks.